part of my thesis um, and then wrote it up and then submitted it to JFP middle of last year. Got rejected, but rejected nicely. They said, what you need, this looks promising, but what you need is some more meta theory, like actually more proofs about the properties of this language. Like I described the properties of the language that they should have, um, but I had, didn't have formal proofs just because that's, that's heaps of work. <laughs> so I've been talking about uh, cock proofs in my last few talks, and that's sort of working towards it. But in the reviews, I got, <laughs> why are you guys sniggering there? Something else? <laughs> yeah, peanut <laughs> gallery. Anyway, so in the reviews, one of the reviews says that uh, the, the, the semantics I had written, one of my rules of reduction for DDC core was unhygienic. Hygienic. And I hadn't heard that word, that term before, unhygienic. What does it mean for a, a, a type system to be unhygienic? Uh, pardon? Did what? No? <laughs> was that obscene? Okay, yeah. You said he said something obscene, so he can't repeat it on, on tape. <laughs> but I'm going to try and explain what unhygienic means. I, I've I fixed it. I've worked at how to, how to fix it, and it's, it's looking good now. Uh, but when I started writing this talk, it seemed like the talk was going to be too long. So this is like the part one. Part one is describing the problem. And then part two, which I'll present next month, is actually the actual solution. But as long as we understand what hygienic means and region phase change, then that'll be enough for today. Um, and I've lost, the, I've lost my clicker, so um, I just have to press buttons. So it might be a bit awkward. Uh, so DDC has mutable references. Uh, so here's an example of using mutable references. But I've changed the syntax of this just to make my talk easier. So uh, what I've done here, instead of saying like a, a value, value binding, let something in, I've said let ref. They're just making my, my talk easier. So let ref defines a reference. So x is going to have type ref to string. Okay. So my silly example, I'm going to read the reference, put the string foo. I'm going to write bar into the reference, and then I'm going to read the reference and put the string bar. Okay. This is my, my silly example. So read ref and write ref can have these types. So in, in DDC call proper, um, you can up, update arbitrary, arbitrary algebraic types. But just for the talk, we'll just say that ref, mutable references always have type ref. Okay. So programming references. Um, maybe I'll, I also made these um, slides in a hurry, so they're in the wrong order. So we think about. Uh, how this program is going to evaluate. So I'll step through the evaluation, then I'll talk about the evaluation rules. So when I write, uh, write the evaluation, I'm going to write a uh, description in the heap on the left-hand side, semicolon, and then the program which is currently being reduced. Okay, so I'm going to step this, and at every step, something's going to happen until we get to the end. So when I have let ref x equals foo, what, what this does is it creates a, a new reference in the heap. So I end up with a, a, a binding in the heap, and the reference is at some heap location, which I've called L. Okay, so I have my original heap. I've extended the heap with a new location. I've bound the location to the value foo, and then I substituted the new location for x in the, in the, in the term. You see, see that? I'll flip between it. So We've got x here, and I said let ref x equals foo. So when this steps, I end up with a new heap location called L. It's bound to the string foo, and I substitute L for x into the, into the term. Can we see that? So here are the, oh, sorry, I'll continue on. So, and then the rest is, is obvious, right? So when, when I, I read a reference L, I load foo into that position, foo. Run putster, I get foo on the console. <laughs> when I write ref, write a reference at location L, change this to bar. There we go, now it's bar. Read the reference, so it says how, bar. How does transformation work if I know that let ref x equals, like we have a guess of what ref x is like. So you end up with different locations. So this, this, 
this isn't a transformation as such. It's just uh, stepping through the evaluation. So uh, this is what the, the program does at runtime. So you imagine, uh, remember if you, if you take a lambda calculus term and then run it, you just uh, find function applications and then do substitution and substitute the argument into the, the function and continue on. So I'm just doing the same sort of thing. So here I had let ref x and then let ref y. So when this one, the outermost thing reduces, I get some location I've called L. If I had another let ref, I'd get another location L2 down to the other argument. Yep. So I'm paying particular attention to the fact that in this program, this thing here is called x. So it's a, it's a binder in my program. But when I run it, the x changes to L. Okay. So instead of just naming, naming the reference x, when it runs, we have a location which represents like a pointer into the heap. And I substitute that location into the program. Okay. So this, we've got these variables in the original thing. And then now I have locations. So this is the, the phase change. I have program text which I write. So this, this is program which is compiled. But when program runs, I don't talk about variables. I talk about locations. Okay, this is the phase change. So I can write down the evaluation rules for this. Uh, it says just what I said. When I have a let ref form, when it steps, I allocate a new uh, location L and then substitute L for X in the term. Uh, read ref just finds the location that I'm talking to and then returns the value. And then write ref updates the, the value. So there are my evalu evaluation rules. So this is the phase change here. I, I, had, I had variables originally, but now I've got locations. What do I say about this? So this sort of, this idea of phase change also shows up in the typing rules for let, let ref. So here's the, how do you work out the type of let ref? Well, First, you work out the type of the value. So if you say the value has uh, some type T1, and then you add that type to the type environment. So now uh, this T can refer to X when it's working at its type. And the type of T has, or the type of X has type ref T1. So that, that works. What I'm trying to say here is that. Um, when I'm talking about variables, variables go to into the type environment. So like names from the program go into the type environment. And I can check the program in this form. I'm not sure if this really makes sense to people which, have, which aren't <laughs> up to their armpits in type theory. Mm. And we just continue on. I feel like I'm talking to the half people. Half the people in the room says, oh, that's obvious. And other half say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I just continue on. So the, the typing rule for variable says that if I have some variable and I want to find its type, I go looking in the, in the, the type environment. But it says, well, what happens if you have a location? What happens if, I'm if uh, uh, I have a location and I want to find its type? Well, you don't get. Uh, you don't get locations from the type environment because this type environment sort of only contains stuff which is static in the program. Variables are static, they're in the source program. But locations are created at runtime. So the types of locations go into the store typing. So it's like these are two maps which store the types of free, free names. Type environment stores the types of variables. Store typing stores the types of locations. That's right. They don't appear in the source program. Because when I, when I write the program, I'm only talking about abstract binders. Locations only start to exist when the program runs. So if you imagine I want to take my program and type check it, 
because my program only contains variables, I could use typing rules which don't have a store typing at all. Because the program's never going to have variable. I mean, this source program's never going to have locations. Therefore, I don't need a store typing. Because store typings only hold the types of locations. But when I run the program, say if I have a, a, a program which is, is in progress, now when I find, want to find out the type of this, now there's locations in the program. So I'll need a store typing to keep track of what the types of all these things are. Yeah. So it's like the, the, this, this phase change is also present in the typing rules, the difference between the type environment and the store typing. Yep. <laughs> what do you mean? No, no, this is, this is just me not typing my rules up in LaTeX <laughs> and trying to make it obvious what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think uh, Tom, no, Tim, Tim said last, a few times ago when I was showing some cock proofs, he said the, the typing rules I put up looked really scary to him because he didn't understand the Greek. But when I showed the cock definition, it seemed more obvious to him because it had names, yeah. like type, etc. Like this is pretending to be a turnstile, right? It's like environments, turnstile, whatever. What does that mean? But in the cock proofs, it says type and kind. So I'm trying to use just names instead of symbols is all. That's why. OK, so. We got these two phases. We got binders in binders which are in the program. We have locations which are in the in the running program. Locations sort of mean pointers, sort of. Okay, now we've got mutable references. Now I'm going to extend my language so I can talk about regions as well, region typing. So what I've done here, I've added a, a new syntactic form which creates a new region. So a region is a, a, a space in the heap where I can allocate things into. So instead of just having one big heap, where when I allocate a new object, it just goes into, into the heap somewhere. Now I partition the, region, the, the heap up into several regions. And when I say, uh, create a new object, I say, this object, or this, this reference, goes into a particular region. So I can say, it's going to go in there. Okay. I could write, maybe at the top, I could have a let region R2 maybe. I could define some more references. I can put them in different regions. So you use regions to try and uh, separate your heap out into disjoint sections uh, for, I guess, two reasons. Two reasons you might do this. Uh, first of all, if you have objects in different sections, you can in the type system prove that if you're writing to objects in one region, it doesn't affect op operations on the other region. Uh, the second reason is uh, it helps managing allocation, which we'll talk about in a sec. Anyway, so we have these two extra form, let region, and then I've extended the let ref form, which says which region you're going to put the reference into. Okay. So we can show, so yeah. When I'm doing this, I'm also going to extend the, the types. So when I, when I create a reference x, so x is a reference which, hold, which holds a, a string foo. And then in the type, I'm also recording what region it's in. So x is a reference in region r, which holds a string. And then here's the types of read ref and write ref. You notice that. Uh, these types have quantifiers out the front. So read ref can read a reference in any region, and then write ref can write a reference into, or write a reference which is in any region because it's, it's quantified. Okay. I know the rules, but I should have showed the, showed the example first. So here's the evalu evaluation going. So you start out with a, with a heap whatever's in there. So the first step, so when it runs, I'm flipping, flipping between these two things. I start, this let region here holds uh, the name for a region. So it's like an, an abstract name of a region which 
I'm talking about in the source program. But in the runtime system, the runtime system doesn't reason about regions in terms of these names. When you're writing a runtime system and you want to write a function which means create region, you want to maybe allocate a chunk of memory and then make a handle which refers to the descriptor which describes where the region is in memory or something like that or how many things it has in it, um, how long it's been alive, something like that. So when, when you want to allocate a new region, what I want to do instead is to do a phase change again. Instead of talking about a region in terms of the name in the source program, I'm going to talk about my region in terms of the handle or the, the descriptor of the region, the descriptor of the chunk of memory. So when this runs, I have my original heap and I have P, which is a, I'm going to call a, an abstract description of, of the region handle. So imagine P represents the description of where this thing is in memory. So we've also done a, a phase change. We've changed from region names in the source program. When it runs, at runtime, we don't talk about names, we talk about region handles. And once again, the region handle is substituted for the region variable in the program. So if we do this, so as before, this is compile time and runtime. We're talking about region handles. And when this continues on, so when I, when I allocate the reference, I'm going to say allocate me a reference x with initial contents foo at some region t. And the way I write that is over here. So I have heap with the region handle, and I have a location in region p which contains contents foo. So this, this is like I had before, but my locations are also annotated with the region that they're in. And this continues on as before. So you read a reference and it's foo and, and such like. But the important point is that locations are now also in regions. So I'll show you the, the eva eva evaluation rules for that. It's just what I said. Uh, when you have a let region R in T, when you run it, you allocate a fresh region handle which is equivalent to allocating the region, substitute the region handle for R in the term, and carry on. And then now when I evaluate a let ref, uh, do the same as before, but annotate the location with the region that it's in, and substitute, substitute the location into the term. Okay, so that's the evaluation. Uh, so here's the typing rules for that. So let region is fairly straightforward. When I check the type of let region, what this does is introduces a, a new region variable. And I say region variables have kind. This means region. <laughs> Just like star, but it means region instead. So imagine in Haskell, star, they use that for the, the type, sorry, the kind of value types. Whereas in this, I'm using percent as the kind of region types. But all it means is that uh, I add the region variable to the type environment. That means the term in the body can refer to this region name uh, in the program. And so if you look at the, the rule for a let ref, the important point here is that, uh, remember, when we, talk, when we have uh, region typing, the reference types also contain region variables, right? Because references are annotated with which by region they're in. Now, regions sort of describe where something is in the store. And I've, and I've colored this red because it's talking about the store. And I've also colored the store typing red because that's also talking about the store. But look how this, this region is in the type environment. So I said that Regi type environment should sort of talk about things st which are statically defined in the program. And the store typing talks about dynamic stuff which exists at runtime. But now, in the typing rules for this, the region variable is also in the type environment. So 
that'll be important in a bit. <laughs> okay, are we happy with this so far? So we, we have region information in types, but types is supposed to be a static thing, but regions talk about a runtime property. So here's where the unhygienicness comes in. I'm gonna evaluate this program again and watch what happens to the types. So uh, I'm just gonna very slowly. This defines a new region and I'm creating a reference X in that region. So you say, what's the type of X? X has type ref r string. So the reference is in that region. So look at the, <laughs> this, this r and this type. When it steps, we allocate, an, when, when this evaluates, you generate a new region handle and substitute the handle for all occurrences of r in the term. And when you do that, so here's, here's the, the region handle p substituted for r. But now, x has type ref p string and not ref r string. So the type has changed. So the type has changed during evaluation. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> so, and on last, last couple of months ago, I was talking about when trying to prove progress and preservation. Progress says a well type term can always take a step. And preservation says that if a well type term takes a step, then the result has the same type as before. Whereas this program is not the case. This program, the, the type has changed when I stepped because this region variable has undergone a phase change. We're talking about runtime things instead of compile time things and runtime things are, are present in the type. So when I was doing my, my thesis, um, I realized this was happening and I got really worried about it <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I did a hack, right? So the hack was to keep track of the relationship between region variables and the region handles that they had been <coughs> substituted for. So it's like a, like a mapping. Every, every time you allocate a new region handle, say, oh, this region handle really belongs to a region named R. And then I weaken my preservation theorem, which says that when a program takes a step, the result doesn't have to have the same type as before. It only needs to have a type similar to before, modulo rewriting of R's to, R's to, R's to P's. But it's not really that satisfying, I think. <laughs> it would be nice if the program, you could say, well, when it steps, it has the same type as before. Minus, minus hacks. So another, another thing about that, it's okay, maybe I should back up. So we're talking about phase change. Something's happened here. It's like, I'm trying to think in philosophical terms, what does it mean for R to change to P when this, when this runs? I don't know, I mean, can we learn anything from it? Uh, it's like, when you have an R, you know that the region hasn't been created yet because we're only talking about it in terms of variables. But when it takes a step, if you have something of type ref p string, you know that the only place you could have gotten a p from is from a let region running, therefore the region must have already been created. So maybe you could do something in your type system which checks or knows when a region has been created because you've got P's instead of R's, or something. But yeah? That's right. So every every time, every every time this program uh, runs, this fragment runs, you get a fresh P, and then in my original system, you'd have a similarity binding between R and that that fresh P. So yeah, every time you, that's why you sort of need the phase change because. When you, when you run this fragment of code, you want it to allocate a new region every time. You don't want something called R, you want a new, a new P, a new region being created. So think about what do these types actually mean? What does it mean to have a, 
an R, not a P, or whatever. If you look at this piece of code to start with, so what's this doing? It's allocating a new region. It's creating a new reference at R and returning the, the, the reference X. So the type of this code, or this type of this fragment, is ref R string. Note that the, you've created a region called R, and the type of the whole fragment has ref R string, which means when, when this program runs, when it's finished, what's happened is that now there's a new region in the store that wasn't there before. Okay? And it's obvious from the type because you have this object in the region and it says, I'm in the region R. <laughs> it's obvious, you're just looking at the type. What happens when you run a, a program of this type? Well, it allocates a new region because I can see that it's made one because it's got a region variable in the type. What happens when you run this fragment instead? So this one allocates a new region. It creates a new reference in the region, reads the reference, and then puts a string. So it just says foo. But the type of this fragment has type unit. So the difference between here is well, with this one. If you have something of type unit, you can't see the fact that this thing used a region. So just imagine you have, you're given an expression which has type unit and you evaluate it. You don't know what's going to happen other than it's going to return your unit. You don't know from this type that it's made any regions. Whereas with this type you do because you can see the region in type. So, uh, okay, so the other thing regions are good for is, is allocation handling. So in the ML kit, uh, system, which is a ML dialect which uses regions for allocation. They say regions are like little pieces of stack. We can allocate them when we do a let region. We allocate references into the into the into that region, so little sort of like a stack frame. And then when we leave the scope of the let region, we can pop that region off the stack and deallocate it. Okay. So you can say. Let regions are like stack frames. You, you create a stack frame, allocate things into the stack frame, and then when the let region scope is finished, you can pop it off the stack. But you can only do that when the return type doesn't contain the region variable R, because you know for sure, for sure, that there's no references to the region after the thing runs. Well, that's true with this piece of program, but not that piece of program. With this piece of program, there is a reference to the region after it runs, x, but with this, there's not. So you can try and hygienify, <laughs> add, add more conditions to the typing rules to hygienify, <laughs> make the, the let region thing more hygienic, to try and do things like uh, region-based deallocation. You can say, well, here's the same typing rules before, and that used to be percent, but that's fine. Uh, let region, the term T can refer to the new region, but I'm going to not allow any program fragments which have the region which I've allocated in the return type. So if R appears in the return type, I say that's not allowed. Okay? If I use this rule, I'm saying that if R appears in the return type, then the program is bad. So that would reject this program, says that's not a good program throw it out, but accept this one. And if you do that, supposedly, then you can use this stack-based region allocation. Sort of. So that, that almost works. So can you see the, the point here? So it almost works except for, anyone think of the, why oh, this might not work? But this is, a, this is a static rule, so I use this to type check my program. Okay. So I use this rule to type check my source program to say that if it type checks with this rule, then I'm allowed to use region-based deallocation when it runs. Can this be spelled in the reference? 
Pardon? Is there any storage in the reference? Still what in the reference? Almost, yeah. So it's, it's in the right track. See, what happens about closures? So imagine this program. So you create the region again. You create a reference to foo, and then return a, a closure, a, f uh, a function term, which is going to read the reference and then return the contents. So the type of this fragment has unit to string. And the region doesn't appear in this type. So it's like the, the region, the information that this fragment is using region R and is holding on to region R when it, when it runs isn't visible in the type, but the, the region, a reference to the region is captured in the closure. Okay? So you, you might think, well, I can think about hygiene and I can try and Add, add some more conditions to my typing rules to try and eliminate, try and find where this program can stash things away. But when you go a bit further, especially with higher order functions and uh, uh, general closures, you can, you can hide things in other places, as you write. You write. Um, so that's, that's my last slide. So any ideas how you'd fix this? So you wanted to do, <laughs> what in? Talk to the ML guys, yeah. So imagine it's like a, an exercise for, for at home. <laughs> what, <laughs> what would we add to this typing rule so that when this program runs, if the, the, the term is holding on to references to this reference in a region, you'll know from the type You have, you'd have to do a, a transitive closure. You have to trace out all possible. Like imagine if you created a, a, a function which holds onto the reference in its closure. Like f f is a function which holds onto the re reference to the. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there's, there's two options I think. So w one is to track effects, and the other is to track closure information. So the original region, uh, the original type system of MLKit tracked effects, but they didn't call them effects. What you'd say is that, well, this closure is hanging on to a reference to this, uh, heading, hanging on to a pointer to the reference in a region, but that only matters if I'm going to do some kind of operation on the region. So you can assign read ref an effect. So when it runs, you'll see that in the, well, I haven't written it down, but you'd see an effect annotation on the arrow which says that there was an effect on something in region R. And then it shows up in the, the type. Um, the other way is to track the types of all things which are crack, captured in the closure. And you can also see the region annotations that way. Um, I might stop there. So. The other two points I wanted to point out. So first thing was the, the phase change. We have phase change with both locations. So changing variables to locations and also region names to region handles. And also this idea of hygiene. You can get unhygienic programs where uh, the type changes when you evaluate it. They could still say that's OK on some levels. You can try and lock down your type system by imposing different uh, extra rules, but it doesn't always work because the term can squirrel array references to things in other places. So there are my two points. So I'll continue on next one. Thank you. So what did you do the second? What? what did you do? <laughs> oh, it's going to rest the story. <laughs> so I made a beer. <laughs> so why, why did I care? Why, why am I talking about this right now, this sort of thing? So Peter Thiemann. Uh, Peter, Thiemann is an, Peter Thiemann is an eminent researcher um, from Denmark who is doing a sabbatical with us at UNSW. He's just arrived a couple of weeks ago and he's going to be here till March or so. 
And then because he arrived, I was going through uh, some of the stuff he has done. And then he had written some papers on um, type systems, including region calculi. calculi. Because I'm interested in regions, um, I was also reading those papers. I'd had his papers in a stack of papers to read, which is about that, <laughs> that high now. But because he's joined the group, I've lifted all those papers to the top. And then I was reading about some of his papers. And then he was talk he showed a calculus where it solved the problem I originally had in my system, but it didn't explain why. So it's sort of it was a, a paper about um, properties of region calculi. It gives a few different region calculi, proves properties of them like progress and preservation, um, and then shows the correspondence between the two. And he's got a uh, in the type system is some extra stuff which solves the problem I was originally having. But I was, it didn't actually say the problem that I was having. It didn't show, didn't say that it actually solved the problem I was having, even though the system actually did. So this is halfway to showing that why Peter's type system solved the problem I was having originally. So that'll be next month's thing. So the solution is to well, give you a hint at the solution. Uh, Do you want to? Okay, so a hint at the solution is to look at the phase change. It says, well, when this runs, the R changes to a P. Why is that bad? Because the program term itself no longer records the fact that R used to map to P. Okay, so this, this program used to contain the variable R, and when it runs, now it contains the variable p, but the mapping between r and p is lost. I haven't got that written down in this piece of program. Pardon? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, so the, the solution is to, instead of just eliminating let region and allocating p and substituting r for p, you change this thing to use region, like something which says, I've created a new region, and now r maps to p, and then you run this stuff until it's done, while this thing like, sort of at the top of the program is keeping track of the mapping. And then your typing rules are use that to supply the mapping between R and P while this runs. And when it's done, you pop, pop it off. So let region is static information, which only holds the name. When you step it, let region changes to use region, which is a form which only appears in the running program, which maps R to P. While that's there, the body runs. When it's done, you pump the lot off. So. Do you do the same kind of thing with the mapping from X to its location? It's the same problem, right? It is the same problem. But the interesting thing is that uh, the X's value variables never appear in types, so it doesn't matter. Yes, but uh, when you, the reason for having a P is yep. before you're in substitution into the program. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so right. I have a heap. But if you, if you say that the environment has the heap, you yep. have the mapping from the program variable to the location. Yep. So you have the mapping from X to L as part of the runtime system, not changing the program. Yep. And you do the same for the region. You map R to P. That's another part of the runtime system describing the You'd say do it in the program as well. Yeah, but do it for the mapping from X to L. That's a good idea. So instead of having a store typing, do you think? Yeah, that's a Just good point. Just put those point. mappings, the, the, the term variables x, the region variables r, the mappings for those things belong as part of the runtime environment. Yeah. The heap plus all of that stuff is just that runtime system. It's not there for the program. Yeah, but then, then you have to worry about which normal forms the program has. So. Are you allowed to say that something with? Uh, it's just like closure. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? Yeah, maybe. I see the point.
think the standard is still to use the store type thing. Like I've, I don't know, pardon? But yeah, but as, I, as, as you point out, if you're gonna have change let region to huge region anyway, why don't you just do that for locations as well? That's a, that's a good point. Um, I think of some vague things why you might not wanna do that, but we can talk about it afterwards. Okay, thank you, I'm done. <laughs>